sure that we have funding for the scanner. So if you come out and you tell the Port Authority, okay, look, we are going to pay for the scanner, then you now put the onus on the Port Authority. What is your excuse for not implementing it? So that's what I keep saying, that we can't just make excuses about things like that. And in addition to that, I think we have a huge unspent balance account. This is the point which, is which occurs. You see, the, we, we, what happens, eh? I'll tell you, we've gotten so accustomed to the excuses okay. from our leaders that we have actually begun to accept it as the norm. All right, Mr. George, we have another caller online. Caller, good morning and welcome. Uh, gentlemen, pleasant board. Morning. Mr. George, um, we appreciate your articulation. Um, I must admit, somehow, I find the pointing of fingers not sufficiently impartial. I would have preferred your posturing to be sufficiently cognitive in terms of a neutral position. Um, there is someone greater than, the, than you and I in terms of of the overall administration called the central government. Mm -hmm. And they have been dictating to this island, I mean, without, with a level of arrogance and without thought, in my humble opinion. Um, what I would like to suggest to you in terms of a question, how about, and I'm putting it to you, how about taking a more active role, as the previous, previous caller suggested, a more active role, whereby you can actually initiate action rather than uh, be like me and like Colston, we are basically plaintiffs in the system, as you would put it in legal language. Have a nice morning. Thank you very much. And, no, I appreciate, I appreciate that call glad, glad and that point. I'm glad to hear point. you call a happy new year as well. <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you. And no, the thing is, it, it's important, and what, what he's saying is true. Eh? In other words, we can't just sit talking about the problems and, as he says, pointing fingers, because we also recognize that there's a role that the central government has to play in facilitating things in terms of, you know, some, some things you just can't get done without their cooperation and their consent. And I accept that, and in fact, I think, in fairness to Mr. London and the THE, they have articulated that point repeatedly about um, things that they said ha have amounted to disrespect from the central government, non-cooperation from the central government, and I certainly give them that, you know, credit for articulating those points. But what I'm saying is, apart from, okay, you complain about those things, my focus is always action-oriented, results-oriented. So if this is the problem, then, okay, yes, I will let you know that this is a problem. So in other words, okay, yes, we're not getting the full cooperation of central government. But then let's see how we can get around this and find a solution. So it's like the first caller when, you know, he said, well, look, you have to get the Port Authority involved. Yes, I agree. But if it is that the THA were to take the initiative and say, hey, listen, from our allocation, we are going to provide the money to buy a scanner and you make that public, you tell the public, look, we are presenting okay. the THA with a, the port with a scanner. What then could the port say? Okay, Mr. George. We have another call online. Caller, good morning and welcome. Yes, good morning. Welcome, sir. Yes. Um, I want to let the panel know there that quite apart from all the talk about the THA and central government, central government cannot is not allowed to interfere with anything that the TTA mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. here because mm -hmm. they, everything they call them obstructionists. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree with Mr. George, you must have innovative people to run your island, people just with that scanner talk. Let me make this point. I served at the level of the Port Authority and as a board member for three to two terms. And for what I have been seeing taking place at the port, it is regrettable. This, there is no motivation for the security at the port in any way. Mm -hmm. Imagine you have all the security services on this country where you have female representatives or, or members of the security services are being promoted. Not one person is being promoted at the port authority. I worked there for 40 years, mm -hmm. right? And you have junior people, men, you're only giving stripes to the men. Where is the motivation for the women? In the police service, you have a deputy commissioner of police, you have assistant commissioner of police. So there's no motivation at the bottom. And then you recruit a set of little girls, having them lime in with their boyfriends on the port when the morning come. No motivation for anybody to move forward. Mm -hmm. And the management of the port is mainly responsible for that. 
aided and abetted in many ways by the trade union because they condone a lot of nonsense that is taking place. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the THA does have a major role according to the fish schedule where they are responsible for air pitch and the seaport. Mm -hmm. And if they take matters to the government mm -hmm. and they have funds to assist, mention it mm -hmm. and tell the country that we are not going to, the, the government is not cooperating with me to have scanners, because I agree with Mr. George, the bulk of guns that come in on this island is on the ferry, because there's no checks and balances, whatever. You have a security officer there, who they call him a sniffer dog. This man has not been motivated anyway. You want to know where he, how he's able to deal with these drug guys when they come off the boat and so on. And they have not promoted him, and they're just having their hanging in until he's 60, probably to retire. Mm -hmm. So these are little areas that the port and the management should look at. It's, it's regrettable anyway. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for your, con no, your contribution. I, 65 I, I must endorse. And 65 one four one two. I Go must ahead, endorse what that caller said, and in particular, even about that um, particular officer he spoke about. Um, I know the officer, and he is, I mean, that man is a legend. And he does this really just out of his patriotic duty more than anything else, because he goes above and beyond the call of duty to try to ascertain and see who is there, who might be bringing things, who might be smuggling things, and he's actually quite successful. But the point is, you can't have him alone making the effort. You need a co coordinated, comprehensive plan. And this is where we must call upon the police service, and we must tell the commissioner, hey, listen, on every sailing of the ferry, you must have 10 undercover officers. Another thing, on the ferry itself, you must post up big and bold all the pictures and photographs and sketches and drawings of the wanted criminals from Trinidad because a lot of them use the ferry and come across to Tobago to hide. So in other words, when they are walking onto the ferry, they must see their picture. They must be like, uh oh, should I be going here? Because th th this is what you need. So in other words, let every passenger see those pictures so they could say, but wait, listen, that man in that poster, look him sitting across there. So your undercover officers are on the boat, so they just identify the person, they just quietly go to him, take him to a room. Th this is, listen, every sailing of that ferry, you could arrest persons who, whether it's outstanding warrants, whatever, whatever, you can do that. But the point is we sit back and we talk and we complain and we don't do anything. So that's why we need to engage in this type of discussion so that the powers that be can do what is necessary to secure Tobago. Yeah, you know, uh, one fellow said not too long ago that he, he walked through Lower Scarborough uh, on a particular day. And he saw three known guys from Trinidad. He knew he's wanted by the police mm -hmm. in Trinidad. He saw them in, in, in Tobago. One day the police know them. And how would they have come to Tobago? Mm -hmm. Either on the plane or on the ferry? It's, it's as simple as that. So in other words, you have two very small areas to monitor for wanted persons. Put up the posters at the airports. Put their pictures up. Say, hey, listen, in Trinidad, we'll, you don't have big photographs. Oh, we are looking for these, 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 these. If you see them, if you see them coming off the plane, if you see them going on a plane, alert the authorities. Call 800 tips, call the police, call whatever. These are the things we need to do. And I'll tell you something. You just put at the bottom that, look, we are doing this in an attempt to keep Tobago safer for you and your family. So in other words, people will understand, I'll tell you, because initially you will have some persons who will say, well, oh, it's unfair to the wanted person that you have their picture up. But at the end of the day, you have to have the relevance of a social contract. In other words, security and safety is for the general good. So you might have a circumstance where you say, well, look, it might be a bit unfair to an accused person or a wanted person that his picture is up there, but you balance that against what is the greater good. The greater good is the safety and security of your island. And notice I keep stressing island. In other words, we can make Tobago safe. We may not be able to solve the problems of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of an overall national crime plan or crime statistics, but we can make Tobago safer. And I will not ever back down from saying that. And we need to stand up to that challenge and make it a reality. What about the administration building, building in the port to post those pictures as well? 
they can, that, that's another thing. In fact, I was inside that building the other day and I was appalled that I saw persons having to sit on the ground and stuff like that. You had very long lines. They didn't seem to have you know, any, any facility. If, if you're old or disabled or aged or infirm, there's no, you, you, they, I didn't see any chairs in that general waiting area. Maybe they have in other areas, but certainly where you have the tickets being mm. sold and um, where you have to line up to check in, I didn't see anything at all. And these are simple things which can be done for the benefit of Tobagoians. Another thing I've complained about repeatedly, have you ever been to any of the courts um, in Tobago, the magistrate's courts? Or you have hundreds of people just standing there in, in the like corridor, cattle yeah. herded. I have complained repeatedly. Our chief justice is from Tobago. Better ought to be done. You cannot keep treating Tobagonians like that. At some point, they will say enough is enough. You can't have people standing up there for hours and hours and hours, just standing up in a, a corridor, and you know, police officers telling them, move, step back, you know? Provide proper facilities. There's no cafeteria for them. They don't have proper facilities. If somebody has a little baby, you know, because you might have a young mother who has to attend court, maybe even to get a maintenance order or something, so she doesn't have anybody to see after the child. She walks with the baby. There's no little nursery, nothing, nothing, nothing. Come on, this is 2015. Tobagonians, open your eyes and see what the world has advanced to and ask yourself if these conditions are acceptable for us in the year 2015. Okay. Uh, Mr. George. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope I didn't have you at a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, it's, quite, it's quite a mouthful. Yes, yeah, yeah, a mouthful yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you see, the you thing know? is, when, when you're passionate about the development of your place and your island, you, you can't, that, that passion will always burn within you. And I think we have become a little bit lethargic and apathetic in that we have gotten so pressed down and beaten down that that we think that this is the norm and it can't be better. And I keep saying we must have a vision for our future and know that there is a better way, there is a better place, there is a better method of doing things in Tobago. And once we see that and we begin to realize that, I tell you, we will be the best island in the world. In the world. I will never stop saying that. I will sure. never stop believing that. I believe in Tobago and I believe in Tobagonians. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I see that. I see that passion. Yeah, yeah. Every time you come <laughs> right. But, uh, we, we were talking about the, the oil prices, the falling oil prices. And, and, the, and effect the, the effect on Tobago. On, on right. And when you look at that, that's another area where we should have been in a position where we So therefore, we keep depending every year on this subvention from central government. And without that subvention, we really have no economy whatsoever. So that's what we need to start doing in Tobago to develop that level of self-sufficiency where we can say, oh boy, sorry to hear things are not going so good in Trinidad. But you know what? We are going very good. We can help you. That's where we need to become in Tobago. That's where we should be heading for. OK. Uh, so Tobago should sit, you know, very comfortable or should have... We should be, get, to that, yeah, place. get to, to that place. So in other words, we need to focus on ourselves and stop thinking about waiting on a handout from Trinidad. If we develop ourselves properly, if we develop our industry properly in terms of our tourist industry, our service industry, and if we understand the value of that industry, tourism is one of the largest industries in the world. It's a multi, multi billion dollar industry. If Tobago gets its share of that, I can assure you oil prices could fall to zero. It yeah. will not affect us. Tobago. And that's where we need to focus. Okay, we have our final call online. Caller, good morning and welcome. Good Hello. morning. Yes, good morning. Welcome. Mr. George, I have to compliment you with those last talks. It is very, very, very accepted. 
I'm a citizen of Tobago and also a small business dealer. And, and to, 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 to those things that you just spoke about and the war from the different places, we need some more acceleration in Tobago. Let them get up and try to even smiten up the Scarborough town. All these things, they are not, they're just sitting. I just don't know what those 12 cabinet people are doing. They are not doing anything for Tobago. They are not doing it at all. We must try to help them. And if you can come there every morning and show them the point, point out the points. Look, the, look at the policemen. They don't have them in Scarborough. Just have them on the morning, hum, humbugging the heavy traffic. And the day when the evening when the traffic is more heavy, nobody to regulate it, nothing. They need all these assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And, you know, um, I just want to make the point, eh? um, you know, it's not a matter of casting blame or casting aspersions or making criticisms, all right? Because I will tell you that for the years that, I mean, the present administration has been in the THA, they have made several attempts to try and improve things and do good. But what I'm saying is that, okay, we have been brought to this level, but we can be quite up here. So in other words, we thank you for bringing us to this level, but it doesn't mean that we will stop pointing out that we can do better. And I, I want to be going to understand that that's the approach and that's the context. So it's not a question of you know, just pointing fingers and laying blame. We accept that efforts have been made, things have improved to a certain extent, but I'm saying let's not sit back and feel comfortable and say, well, look, this is the best we can be. We haven't begun to tap the vast potential that Tobago has. You look at a place like Speyside. I, listen, Speyside is such a dream in terms of if you were to develop Speyside properly. I tell you, Speyside could become a capital by itself mm -hmm. just for the natural infrastructure they have there with that bay, and you already have one or two, um, you know, you have Blue Waters in, and you have a couple other guest houses and places there. But when you look at the spread of that bay, you have a beautiful developer, say for instance, like Sandals Resorts, to put down a massive hotel there. Think of the employment, the industry, the agriculture. They will need to buy the fresh food and vegetables from all the farmers around. The um, produce in terms and, of uh, mutton. And, and, and the roads may have a super highway going, uh, go, going to there. But, the, but that, the point is, you would also have the facility to be able to develop a marina in that bay mm. because it's a beautiful bay. You think of Parlativer. That is such a dream, such a gem. But the point is, we don't even yeah. realize yeah, well, the be beauty the, and value uh, of what we Palo have. To be the best of all. This is what I'm saying. We don't even realize what we have. And that, that's why we really need to wake up and shake up. Mm -hmm. I tell you, Tobago needs that, you know. Yeah. Tobago needs a wake up and shake up so that we begin yeah. to understand. Because when you travel and you see what people are able to do with much less than what we have, then you realize, but wait, man, we've been dreaming, yeah. sleepwalking, yeah. we like zombies. Yeah, we have it naturally, but we the infrastructure need to needs, to be, and needs understand to be here to complement that. Every Tobagonian mm -hmm. should be a multi-millionaire from the potential we have in this place. I'm telling you, okay. there's no excuse for it. Okay, Mr. George, we always have time <laughs> constraints. <laughs> we always have time constraints here. Yeah. So I want to thank I want to thank you this morning for for you know uh, for for commenting you know giving your your your, your comments here this morning. You know, I want to thank the public for, for calling and joining the, in the conversation. Yes. And we certainly invite you again. Uh, viewers, we go for a break now. When we come back, we come back with Mr. Sherwin Cunningham, you know, noted Calypsonian, and he'll be talking about the opening of a Calypso tent later this afternoon. We go for a break and return to you in a moment. <laughs>